Luke 10, verse number 19. You have it, so praise the Lord. That Luke Gospel, chapter 10, verse number 19. And it reads, Behold, I give you power. Behold, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yeah, I want to preach to you on the subject this morning. Hallelujah. I want to preach to you on the subject this morning. A taste of triumph. A taste of triumph. A taste of triumph. I need you to look at your neighbor and, and, and tell your neighbor, neighbor, what you need. Is a, taste is a taste of triumph. Of triumph. Amen. As we look at this Luke Gospel chapter 10, verse number 19, what we see is a beautiful picture of a group of people who have just tasted a piece of triumph. We see a group of people who have just tasted a piece of triumph. In chapter 9, Jesus gave power to his apostles. And now in chapter number 10, he is giving a different group a certain portion of this power. He's giving this different group a certain portion of their, this power to go out and preach and work miracles. So the Bible says in Luke Gospel 10 and 1, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Please understand, I need you to understand something, that Jesus has chosen two different groups for two different purposes. He's chosen two different groups for two different purposes. The purpose of the apostles were to stay with Jesus. Uh, uh, the purpose of the apostles were to hear his instructions, to be, a wit to be witnesses to his miracles, to be witnesses to his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension back into heaven that they may proclaim all these things unto the world. So they was, they was, their purpose was to stay with Jesus so they could pertain all these things unto the world. Now, the purpose of the 70 disciples were to go out and preach immediately where Jesus was about to come to. In other words, their job was to go out and prepare the way for his coming. So he chose these 70 disciples to go out and prepared the way for his coming. Therefore, Jesus mobilized the troops, and he just sent them out. Jesus said in verse number 3 of that chapter number 10, that go your way, behold, I send you out. He said, go your way, behold, I'm sending you out. I need you to go out. I need you to preach to where I'm about to go to. And then not only he, when he told them this, he told them what to take, he told them what to do, and they went out and came back with an experience. Let me say this again. After he told them what to take, after he told them what to do, they came back. They went out. They came back with an experience. In other words, they noticed something. They noticed that it was something in his name. They noticed that it was something about his authority which caused them to have this joyful disposition. Watch this now. They noticed that it was something about his name. They knew it was something about his authority which caused them to have this joyful disposition. In other words, what could it be? How did this happen? You got 70 people 
going out, doing the Lord's work, and all of them came back full of joy. Watch this now. You got 70 people going out and all of them coming back full of joy. They were excited. They were greatly excited about what they experienced. How is it that they ex the, the experience itself left 70 people filled with so much excitement? I'll tell you what it was. It was a taste of triumph. Let me tell you like, what, let me tell you like this. With some of us, all it takes... It's just a little bit of Jesus. Yeah. Watch this now. With some of us, a little bit of Jesus will go a long way. Yeah. Watch this now. Because you got 70 disciples who experienced a brief sample of God's power, and they all came back full of joy. All they had was, and God just gave them a tidbit. He just gave them a small portion of something, and they came back. And just a little bit of Jesus will go a long way with certain people because the Bible said 10 and 17, that then the 70 returned with joy. He didn't say, he said they returned with joy. Watch this now. They didn't return with resentment. They didn't return with how hard the work was. They didn't return with how the demons were too strong for them. But the Bible said, no, 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 no. The Bible said the 70 returned with joy. Now, you mean to tell me that a brief, one brief sample of God's power caused them to act with so much excitement and gladness? Yeah. And the Bible said, yes, it, it, one brief sample of God's power caused such an excitement within these people that they were so excited and so glad to the point that the evidence is right here in the text. Watch this now, because I need you to understand something. Sometimes... God will give you a brief sample of his power just to ignite you into joy and gladness. Yeah. Let me say this again. Sometimes God will give you a brief sample of his power just to ignite you into joy and gladness. He will give you a taste of triumph to stimulate you, your heart into joy. Let me tell you something. God will give you a taste of triumph to stimulate your heart into joy. Let me tell you something. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to John Gospel chapter number 1. John Gospel chapter number 1. Jesus is about to meet a man named uh, Nathaniel. And I want to show you what occurred when upon Jesus meeting this man called Nathaniel. Because sometimes God will give you a taste of triumph to, sti to stimulate your heart to joy. Watch this in First, I mean, John Gospel, chapter number 1, verse number 43, and this is what it reads. Are y'all there? John Gospel, chapter number 1, verse number 43. When you have it, so praise the Lord. This is what he says in verse number 43. It said, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, when, now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip found Nathan and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Watch this now. And Nathan said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. He said, is it anything good? Nathan said, is it anything good that can come out of Nazareth? And, and Philip's reply was, come and see. Check this out now. Jesus gave Nathan a one brief sample of his power, and it changed his disposition into joy. Yeah. Let me tell you again. Jesus gave him one, just one brief sample of his power, and he changed Nathan's disposition into joy. Watch this now. Verse number 47, Jesus saw Nathan coming towards him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no God. Nathan said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before Philip called you, when you was under the fig tree, I saw you. He said, Before Philip called you, when you was under the fig tree, I saw you. Watch this now. One taste... One experience changed this whole attitude. Amen. One taste, one experience changed this whole attitude. Watch this. In verse number 49, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. 
You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you only got a taste, a brief sample of the power. You haven't seen nothing yet. You only seen, you only got a taste of it, a brief sample of it. But watch this, Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus said in verse number 50, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said unto him, most assuredly, I said unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, Nathaniel's encounter with Jesus produced a certain kind of joy and gladness within him. Please understand, for us, watch this now, for all of us, for us as the true believers of the Most High God, real joy is produced through our experience with him. Let me say this again. If you're looking for joy joy from God, the joy is going to come through your experience with him. Oh, I wish I had a witness up in here. Your joy is going to come from the experience you have with him. And joy comes, in other words, joy comes when God gives us a taste of victory. A taste of triumph. I'm going to say this again. Joy comes when God gives us a taste of victory and a taste of triumph. Watch this now. A taste of triumph should always produce a certain kind of joy and gladness within the life of his people. Let me say this again. A taste of triumph should always produce a certain kind of joy and gladness within the life of his people because a taste of triumph is a confidence booster to the one who is receiving it. Let me say this again. Oh, my God. There's some work need to be done in this house. A taste of triumph is a confidence booster to the one who is receiving it. Let me say this again. Sometimes God would allow you to get, get would, would allow you to get a taste of triumph just to build up your confidence in Him. He would give you a taste of triumph for it to build the confidence up in Him. See, you you want to know the real reason why David wasn't afraid of his giant? He he wasn't afraid of his giant because God gave him a taste of triumph. A taste of triumph. In other words, God gave him a taste of triumph by using his experience with the lion and the bear. Oh, I wish I had a witness up in here. Sometimes God would allow you to go and experience something to encounter a taste of triumph. Watch this now. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. See, David encountered this taste of triumph. Through his experience with the lion and the bear. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 34. 1 Samuel 17 and 34, the Bible said, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, he said, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. He said, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine and Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. In other words, watch this now. God gave David one brief sample of his power, and David produced the confidence to kill a giant. Let me tell you right now, God will give you one taste of triumph, and he can give you enough confidence to slay whatever that stand before you. He can give you one taste one brief sample of his power and it would boost your confidence to a level that you would say anything that stand before you. And here again now, Jesus gave 70 disciples a taste of triumph. He gave them a taste of triumph and they all came back with joy and a built up confidence. What's going on with the sound? They came back with a joy and a built up confidence. Luke, Uh, Luke 10 and 17 said, And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said in in verse number 19, Behold, 
I have given you power, a taste of triumph, a taste of victory, to trip over uh, serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. In other words, Jesus said, I have given you power. What? He said, I've given you power. Watch this now. What power is he talking about? What power is he talking about? See, when you look at the power, you got to understand the power that he's talking about. He is talking about the exousia power. See, there is a power that's called, in the Greek, it's called the exousia. And what the exousia is, it is the privilege and right and authority which gives us a certain jurisdiction over Satan and his demons. Let me say this again. The exousia is a privilege, a right, and an authority which gives us a certain jurisdiction over Satan and his demons. Watch this now, because I need you to understand something. Because this ain't just, uh, this ain't just uh, 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 for certain people, but this is for everybody. Watch this. Everyone who has been born again, who's been filled by his spirit, and who are full of the Holy Ghost, has been given his power. Yeah. If you've been born again, if you've been filled with his power, you got exousia. You got the exousia of power. You got the privilege. You got the right. And you got the authority over Satan and his demons. You need to understand this. If you are dwelling in Jesus Christ, you have this exousia of power. And it's not just for the leaders, but it's for everybody that's in the kingdom of God. The Bible said in that Luke Gospel 10 and 17, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in your name. One translation said, even the demons obey us. Another translation said, even the demons submit to us in your name. See, this is the problem with the church. You, you have to know who you are in God. And a lot of people within the church don't know who they are in God. See, you have to know who you are in God to use this God-given power. See, the devil capitalized capitalize off you being ignorant to knowing who, who, to who you are in God. He want to capitalize on the ignorance so you won't operate in the exousia. Because when you know who you are and who you serve, he knows that you have certain jurisdiction over him and his demons. And somehow the church don't understand that this power that they got. And it's not just for the preacher, but it's for the whole body of Christ. You have power to tread over snakes and scorpions. And when you understand this, you will make my job easier. You don't have to call me to give, deal with that demon. You ain't got to call me to deal with that. You have to realize that God has given you some authority. Over the devil and over the demons. You got to operate in your God-given authority. You got God-given authority. And you ain't got to wait on anybody to use it. You ain't got to call this one or that one. You just operate in the power that God have already given you. Use what God have already given you. God have given us the power. Watch this now. Power to trample on serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy. He, in other words, when he said the type of power that he have given us, watch this now. God has given us the power to crush. Let me say this again. He have given us the power to crush all the power of the enemy. He have given us, that's what he's talking about. When he's talking about trampling, he's talking about crushing. In other words, God has given us the power to cause damage or injury to Satan and all his demons. You have a power within you that can cause damage or injury to Satan and all his demons. Watch this now. Jesus go on to say, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. One translation says, and nothing shall in any way harm you. Listen, I need you to understand something. Because God has given us power that consists 
of offense and defense. Let me say this again. God has given us a power that consists of both offense and defense. He has given us a power with an ability to crush all the power of the enemies and with the same ability to protect us from being hurt or hurt or harmed by the enemy's attack. So he has given us a power to crush the enemy. Crush everything about the enemy's camp and he has given us the same ability to protect us from being hurt or harmed by the enemy's attack. See, this is the blessing that comes along with the power. But here is where Jesus takes an issue with this though. Jesus said, I got an issue with this. Because he don't want us to let this power to be the reason for our joy. I'm going to say this again. Jesus do not want us to let the power be the reason for our joy. In other words, I didn't give you a taste of triumph for you to rejoice because you have the power that has been given to you. But I gave you a taste of triumph to rejoice in the fact that you are truly saved. Amen. Let me say this again. Amen. I didn't give you the taste of triumph for you to rejoice about the power that was given to you, but I given you a taste of triumph to rejoice in the fact that you were truly saved. Watch this now. Jesus said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In other words, the real basis for the joy shouldn't be for the power but it should be for salvation. See, we have a church now. And, I, and I, can, I, can, I can only imagine what Jesus was thinking about when he said, made this statement because the statement that he made is going on within the church now where people are more excited about the power than the fact of being saved. We have now a church that's full of people that's got more joy in titles and positions didn't the fact that they've been saved. I don't care about a title. I don't care about a position. What, I, what I'm excited about is my name is written on the Lamb Book of Life. What I'm excited about is that there's, my name is on the roll in heaven. Because just you, because you can preach, just because you can prophesy, just because you hold a position in the church, just because you have a little bit of power, that don't mean that your name is written on the Lamb Book of Life. There's going to be a lot of Pastors in hell. There's going to be a lot of people that hold positions and titles in church in hell. Your joy should not be in the, the, the joy of the power, but your joy should be the joy that your, land, your, life, your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life, that you are saved. Rejoice that God has made you a true citizen of the kingdom of God. Rejoice because your name are written in, the, in, in heaven. Rejoice because you have been made perfect before God through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 12 and 23 declares that we are just men made perfect before God. Please understand, when your name is written in heaven, it means that you have, been, you have gained God's approval and have gained eternal life. See, I don't care about the title and uh, uh, the, the titles that comes along with this. I care about my name being written in heaven. Because if my name is written in heaven, that means I've gained God's approval and I will gain eternal life. Because everybody's name is not written in the book. But rejoice that your name is written in the book. Not because you have these demons are subject unto you and people are caught up in your title, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Jesus said in Revelation 3 and 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And now he says here, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written 
in heaven. Check this out. These 70 disciples had a taste of triumph, and they were excited. Sometimes, I'm here to tell you now, sometimes all we need is a taste of triumph. That's, that's what we need. Every now and then, you have to pray to God, Lord, just give me a taste of victory. Give me a taste of triumph. Give me a brief sample of your power to stimulate my heart to joy and to build my confidence in you. Because what I've learned is that a taste of triumph, watch this now, is good, especially in times of adversities and calamities. Let me say this again. A taste of triumph is good, especially in the case of, uh, in, in, in the times of adversities and calamities. Sometimes God will give you a taste of triumph when times are heavy. Sometimes God will give you a taste of triumph when, 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 when times are dark. Sometimes God will give you a taste of triumph when your, everything in your life seems to be falling apart. Just like up in Jeremiah 29 and, 9, and 29 and 11. When, and, and, and that time they were going through and things were falling apart. But God said, I'm going to give you a taste of something that stimulates your joy and your confidence in me. He said in Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an ex a future and a hope. One translation to, said to give you an expected end. God wants to give you a taste of triumph. Just like he did it for various people throughout the word of God. God gave Joseph a taste of triumph with a dream. Which caused his brothers to hate him. And sometimes God will give you a taste of dream. He will give you a dream. He would speak a word to your spirit and speak a word to your heart just to get, stimulate your heart to joy to build up your confidence in him see every now and then God will show you something he might not show you all of it but he will show you something that will resonate in your spirit that cause you to have a joy and a confidence in him that say this thing will not get the best of me this thing is not the death of me but there is something that God is showing me and he will give you a taste of triumph. Joseph had a dream. Which he didn't know at the time. The Bible said in Genesis 37 and 8. Joseph had this dream. And he was excited about it. And he revealed this, thing, this dream to his brothers first. And then his father. The Bible said in that Genesis 37 8, and his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? <laughs> or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And verse number 10 says, So the, he had another dream. Verse number 10 says, So he told it to his father and his brothers again. And his, father's re his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his fathers kept the matter in his mind. Watch this. Joseph didn't understand then that God had given him a taste of triumph. See, right now, God is showing you something. And you don't even know that God is just giving you a taste of triumph. He's just showing you something. You don't understand it now. Because Joseph didn't understand it until he, he was sold into slavery. After he was sold into slavery. He didn't understand it until after he was sent to prison. He didn't understand it until after he was in the, uh, the palace. The Bible said he got his understanding in Genesis 45 and 7. This after the fact. See, God would allow us some time to go through some things and then he'd give you a taste of that triumph. And then you would understand it later. 
So Joseph gets the understanding in Genesis 45 and 7. He said, and God sent me. He said, this is what he told his brother after he revealed himself. Here it is. Uh, 13 years later. And God is showing him the victory. He's showing the, the after effect of that taste of triumph. He's revealing himself to his brother. Y'all remember when I told you I had that dream? Y'all remember when I told you that God had did this and he was going to do something great in my life and y'all didn't believe me? He said, y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? Y'all never thought about it when y'all sold me into slavery. Y'all wrote me off. Y'all never thought about it when I went into to, uh, uh, to prison. Y'all thought I was wrote off. Y'all never thought about this. But guess what? God would turn the table. Look what he says. He said, I want you to know that it ain't because of what you did. Right. So you got to realize whatever happening in your life is right. not happening because of what somebody else is doing. Right. But it's happening because God's hand is allowing it. Everything that's happening in your, in your life is not by happenstance. God is allowing it. God has orchestrated it to get you and to position you to where he wants you to be. Yeah. That's why you can't take what you're going through personal. Because you don't know God is setting you up. He know about that hater going telling the boss about things. He's setting you up. He know about what's going on in your life. My Bible said his eyes are open on the righteous. So his eyes are on us. But look what he says. He said, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Ain't that something? That's something that you cause an in, you cause injury and hurt to the for the one that delivered you. The one that delivered God, the one that God called to deliver you, is the one that you're doing wrong. See, there's somebody right now you need to hit it. You are going up against somebody and you don't know that God is calling that person to be the one to deliver you. That's why you got to watch how you treat people, how you deal with people. Because the one that you are doing wrong, the one that you mistreated, be the very one that God uses to deliver you. The one that God have position, have delivered his whole family. And this is what he comes to the conclusion. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Watch this now. God said, I want to do it. If I did it for Joseph, I want to do it for you. Because guess what? Everybody that's under the sound of my voice, God gave all of us who believe in him a taste of triumph. What do you mean, Reverend? I'm telling you, he gave us all a taste of triumph when he gave the world Jesus Christ. Because we got Jesus Christ and he reigns and in our lives and in our hearts, we got a taste of victory. Not just a taste, but we got all victory. We got the one that gave us the power, and we got the one that have given us the victory. Yeah. A taste of triumph. Right. Standing all over this building. Right. A taste. A taste. A taste of triumph. 